coming up on ATV News, a community comes to closure in a balloon liftoff for the Pal Boys. And how did you spend Valentine's Day? We'll show you an artistic side of the Day of Romance. In ATV Sports, Stu Morrill says he'd rather be in a dentist chair than in the Spectrum last night. Find out why. It was boot weather this morning, but in ATV weather, I'll tell you what to put on your feet for the rest of the week. Welcome to ATV News, I'm Carly Lichty. And I'm Britta Anderson. The deaths of Charlie and Brayden Pell are still deeply affecting many of us here in Logan. Some community members recently held a gathering to honor the boys and raise awareness on child abuse. Balloons were passed out and speakers were invited to share their thoughts on the two boys and how as community members we can each do our part to prevent acts of violence towards children. One of the great grandmothers of the boys was there as people gathered to sign a card with their regards to the family. Participants attached notes to balloons and after a moment of silence, released the balloons for Charlie and Brayden. I think it's good for the community. It, it's good to have this chance to come together to show support. It's kind of a closure for me because I've been crying all week because of this. So, And I work with kids at the hospital daycare and so I'm around the kids a lot and it just has helped me to come and do this. While some are finding closure with these events, police say the investigation of what led Josh Powell to, such an, to an act such as this are still underway. So maybe you got a box of chocolates yesterday or flowers or maybe even jewelry. But have you ever wondered how these different stores prepare for Valentine's Day? Kelsey Keller saw how these stores make the I love you's and be mine's possible. Kelsey, what can you tell us? Hey Britta, what do you think of these flowers I have here? Oh, I think they're beautiful. I love purple. Yeah, they're purple's a good color. And you know, my Valentine may or may not have given these to me yesterday. It was a very sweet and sappy moment. But the month of February for these stores isn't always sweet and sappy. Sometimes it can be very hectic. Valentine's Day is over, and hopefully the jewelry you bought gets worn. Those flowers will eventually die and get thrown away. And that box of chocolates will definitely get picked over. And although you might be feeling down in the pits now that Valentine's Day is over, many of the companies that sell Valentine's Day gifts are floating on cloud nine. The day before and the day of Valentine's, there's a lot of guys that are a little bit of procrastinators, so it gets really busy those two days. Box them up, make them look pretty. Right. At Jerick's Fine Jewelry, they prepare for the entire month of February to be busier than usual. And this February, they've been selling a lot more than just diamonds. This type of a thing has been really popular this year just because it's kind of that, a little bit more of that trendy look with the long, you know, layered, layered everything um, and different colors, not just necessarily white, but like your blues blues and blacks or even when you get two of them and and layer them. Another store that looks forward to extra sales for Valentine's Day is Bluebird Chocolates Company where the chocolates are handmade every morning and boxed up by the staff. And while their usual chocolates remain popular many people make custom orders which might include a variety of chocolate covered strawberries. Since the gift giving is done, at least for now, these stores can take a breath and wait for the next major holiday to come along. They let me try one of those chocolates. It was like a truffle mint. It was really good. So, great chocolates over at that Bluebird Chocolate Company. Oh, I'm definitely jealous. I wish I would have had that story. Well, you know, I don't know what looks better though, those chocolates or the flowers you're holding, but I never really thought about all that goes into making the Valentine's sales and gifts. Instead of snuggling up to a loved one, many people found themselves drawn to the Leonardo Museum in Salt Lake City for Valentine's Day. Romina Nadakovic went down there to check it out. Valentine crafts of all sorts and a variety of art and activities are bringing families into the Leonardo Museum. This month, the Leonardo brings in artists who teach labs to visitors on how to create all sorts of Valentine crafts. This past weekend was how to create love letters. Because I 
do my craft with words that I would um, encourage people to make Valentine cards using words to make pictures. After learning how to create your own love letter, you can try the Earthwalk, create your own stop motion movie, try the green room, and more. The museum's main attraction is the holotype, which is linked to Utah State University. And we wanted something with a local connection. And we had been working with USTAR, which is a great state initiative that supports research. And we'd been working with some of the folks up at Utah State University and a program that we do called Leo After Hours, bringing really amazing researchers into the community to talk about what they're doing. Algae was the inspiration for the holotype since it is a biofuel. So we, we hired an artist to conceptualize something that could draw people into the topic of algae and biofuels and energy and do it in a really interesting way. The museum also provides galleries and this month's theme is on human rights. Other attractions are the dynamic performance of nature which tells us the temperature in any part of the world along with where earthquakes occur. You can also learn about Utah's demographics. Even the Leonardo employees have art up along with stories to share. The first uh, figure that I did also appeared on the Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band uh, cover with another figure of uh, Shirley Temple. Um, and um, uh, I was a co-designer on that album cover and I got a Grammy for that in 1967. Romina Nadakovic, ATV News. Wow, that looks like a pretty cool place. Thanks, Romina. Yeah, well, you know what? Speaking of cool places, a new sushi place has opened up in Logan. We've got everything you need to know about where it is and how fishy it might be. And journalists got a little taste of the Army, all coming up right after this. How are you celebrating Mardi Gras this year? New Orleans' very own Fat Tuesday party came to Logan over the weekend. Courtney Robinson put on her party hat to get the scoop. Last weekend, Bourbon Street came to Logan with over 100 volunteers. And I'm volunteering for Mardi Gras. We've been staying up for a few days now, and we're expecting a lot of people to come. Several months of planning and several hours of setup, ASUSU put on their highly anticipated Mardi Gras party. Right, we are having Mardi Gras, which is one of the biggest events for ASUSU programming. We're expecting about 3,000 to 3,500 would be ideal, and we've been setting up since about 10.30. This annual Fat Tuesday party is open to all students as well as the public and thousands of people were in attendance. Casinos, aerialists. Uh, these are some uh, silk and aerialists that are uh, performing at the Mardi Gras party. Awesome. It was way cool. It's just got a lot of strength. A live jazz band. Were some of the festivities available. Marcus Wing also DJed the big dance party in the field house. The casino was the main attraction. Guests were given poker chips to gamble. And then the high winner could win one of several prizes. Party favors for guests were henna tattoos. We just had our henna done. I got a seahorse. And tons and tons and tons of beads. With the real Fat Tuesday around the corner, remember, laissez le bon temps rouler and let the good times roll. In Logan, Utah, Courtney Robinson, ATV News. Oh, that looked like a pretty cool party. I've actually never been to Mardi Gras, so. Yeah, well, you know, I went to the Mardi Gras party a few years ago, and I just spent the whole time up at the casino. Lost all my chips pretty fast. <laughs> but USU students are probably still licking their lips after the banquet which was held by the Black Student Union last Friday. Ryan Humphreys grabbed his utensils and shoveled it in. With plenty of food, entertainment, in socializing, there was a big turnout at the Black Student Union Soul Food Dinner. The TSC ballroom was full of students and members of the community alike waiting to eat some traditional southern cooking while watching an evening of poetry, song, and dance. The president, Ashley Miller, expresses her love of the union. Being um, up here at Utah State and being the minority, it's really nice to have people who understand what you're going through that you can fall back onto, and that's what the Black Student Union is basically. The evening included members of the union participating in choreographed dance and even a unique style called stepping. Well, the step show, I mean, I'm, I'm all about the step show. I really like stepping and the girls just, just did a fabulous job. The step performance was great, just so much energy. Planning a banquet like this takes a lot of time, months in fact. Oh, we started back in 
October, September, October. Yeah, so just getting performances and all that kind of stuff, finalizing the menu. Well, the food was delicious. It demonstrated a great culture. The songs were great. The performers, just you could tell they, they loved what they were doing and were having fun, so. Ryan Humphreys, ATV News. The Black Student Union has been on campus for over 20 years. If you'd like to find out more about them and their events, you can check them out on their Facebook page. How would you feel if you knew, knew you were eating raw fish? What if it was wrapped up in seaweed? Now you don't have to drive to Salt Lake for this delicacy. Randall Henry bibbed up and tried the new hibachi grill in town. It's fun to have new things. The Kabuki Sushi on Main Street is a new Japanese themed restaurant. It brings entertaining food preparation as well as fine Japanese cuisine to Logan. We went to the hibachi bar and it was really fun because the cook kind of played around with the food. Kind of reminds me of some other places in Salt Lake and this is the only one here in Logan so I think it's really unique. It was really good. The owners of the Kabuki Sushi stated that they brought this restaurant to Logan so that the people of Logan would not have to travel all the way to Salt Lake to enjoy this unique dining experience. A sentiment echoed by students. I think the variety is one of the most important things. Like, I remember coming up here, you know, seven years ago for my freshman year and there's not as many restaurants. The unique setting makes this a wonderful place to go if you're looking for variety. It may be outside the average student's budget, but the great atmosphere, great food, and friendly service make this a worthwhile investment for anyone who's looking to take that special someone out for a treat. Randall Henry, ATV News. Kabuki Sushi definitely brings some diversity to Logan. Thanks, Randall. Yeah, well, you know, our very own Meredith Kinney is outside right now checking out the weather. Hey, Meredith. Hey Britta, I'm out here and uh, I think this snow could actually keep some of that sushi pretty pretty darn fresh. Um, I will let you know if there's going to be any more coming up on ATV News. Hey Aggies, welcome to ATV Weather. I'm Meredith Kinney. Well, it was snowing out there earlier and that was the storm that was supposed to hit the central part of the state, but apparently it didn't get the memo. Um, the northern part of the state was under a winter weather advisory this morning. Um, you still, this storm right here was causing all that problem. Um, let's take a look at the national weather map. There's heavy snow, snow, there's heavy snow in the Pacific Northwest. Um, but this storm right here is the one that, that caught Utah this morning. Um, <laughs> with this storm moving, the, moving in, the air quality isn't getting better, but hopefully the storm will help clear up that winter inversion. Um, you can see the Utah is still in the sort of yellow zone, so we should be okay for a little bit longer. Um, now let's take a look at the five-day forecast. Today we have a high of 39 and a low of 20. So bundle up because it's going to be a little bit chilly. Thursday we're looking at a high of 39 and a low of 23. Friday to start off your weekend will clear up with a high of 42 and a low of 23. Um, Saturday another storm will move in but temperatures won't start to cool off just yet. There will be a high of 44 and a low of 21. Saturday the snow will be back and we'll have a high of 35 and a low of 19. Well, that's it for your ATV weather. I'll be, we'll be right back with ATV Sports. Hey Aggies, welcome to ATV Sports. I'm Bailey McMurney. You better be ready for the weekly review of Aggie Sports because we're chock full of highlights today. So let's get going. First, we start out with some tumbling, sticking, and hitting. It's not as violent as you think. It's just the women's gymnastics team. They were in the spectrum last Friday and they tried their best to pick up the first win of the season. Meredith Kinney let us know if the ladies came out with a W. The Utah State gymnastics team was edged out of the win in the spectrum Friday night, but that didn't stop them from scoring 15 career highs. The Aggies opened up the meet on vault with freshman Sarah Landis and sophomore Paige Jones slipping to the second and third best scores of the meet. But the real highlight of the meet was on bars. The Aggies entered with the top bars average in the WAC, and they did their best to keep the title. All six Aggie gymnasts set or tied their career highs on the night. Senior Rebecca Holiday threw this massive dismount to score 9.875, good enough to tie with three of her fellow Aggies for the top score. The Aggies moved on to beam where freshman Ashley Follett notched a career high 9.75. Holiday continued her career night with a 9.85 to help the Aggies to a new season high on beam. 
USU struggled on floor, but junior Amanda Wadamaniuk and freshman Susie Miller competed well, scoring career highs. Wadamaniuk notched a 9.8, and Miller landed a 9.85. In the end, the Aggies were edged out of the top spot, losing 194.95 to 194.875. It's painful to lose it by that little bit. I think there's a little bit of mental stuff that we need to work on, but we're getting better, so we'll get there. Meredith Kinney. ATV News. Utah State Gymnastics is back in the spectrum this Friday at 7 p.m. to take on Sacramento State University. The women's basketball team was back in the spectrum twice last week, taking on both Louisiana Tech and New Mexico State. The women's team stormed into the game against Louisiana Tech looking for a win. And you know what? The player of the game was Devin Christensen, who had 22 points, five assists, and made all four, uh, four of her free throws trying her hardest to keep the game at an even pace with her smooth jump shots and tough penetration into the paint. But Louisiana Tech answered right back with three-pointers and tough defense. Louisiana Tech nabbed the win 82-76. to 76. The next game was against New Mexico State, and Maddie Plunkett was ready to shoot some threes. She scored 10 points with five assists and one steal. She's a strong presence in the, po presence in the post and easily went past New Mexico State's defense. Just continued to sink the trays and made some layups, but it was Jenneth Johnson that came out even stronger with 11 points, three blocks, and two steals for the night. She works well in the paint. And I look at her right here, just getting that easy layup, just penetrating right in. She kept her hands swinging for some blocks, but she definitely didn't think the win came from her. I think it was just a team effort. I mean, in the first half, Wolf, we got out rebounded. And that's what we focused on on the second half is rebounding and just coming together as a team to get that win. I think our second half, you know, was way better than the, the first half. And I wouldn't say that it's a tale of two halves, but there was just a more um, concentrated focus on specific areas, um, especially the rebounding, uh, shoring up some things there. And, and you know, I, I feel like uh, we also took more pride in our second half defense. The women are back on the road and play t tomorrow night against the Nevada Wolfpack. The ladies are now 7-2 and two in WAC play and 16-7 and seven overall. And finally, there was a lot of men's basketball in the past week, and I've got all the high and low points for you. It was a Reed and Medlin show last Thursday as the men took on Louisiana Tech. The two together were unstoppable. Med Medlin did what he's known for, birthing triplets. He had 22 points with his eighth double-digit game and seventh 20-pointer game of the season. He has no problem from any angle or distance, even sacrificing his body for the points. Not to mention he gets the team and crowd pumped with his enthusiasm. Look at his face right here. And Keyshawn Reed. Reed was in need of a dunk, and he didn't disappoint the crowd getting some action from the rim with 20 points, 16 of those in the second half, and racking up nine rebounds. Reed probably has the most athlet athleticism on the team, combining speed and size to get past those nasty bulldogs. But this play was the most impressive. A lob from Rocky Payne to Reed, and there he goes. Fans were flipping out over Reed's skills, and the guys were just hoping they could carry over gameplay, but Danny Berger in the New Mexico State game just killed it. He had 14 points, one assist, and played for 32 minutes. And just made some easy jumpers, playing really well, but if it wasn't for that Medlin kid, the Utah State Aggies wouldn't have even had a chance against the New Mexico State Aggies. Despite Medlin's effort, it was Hernst LaRoche that made USU look bad with his deep threes and watch right here in this next play. He falls and barrel rolls, gets back up without missing a beat and blocks pre-med shot. USU was beaten in size and in athleticism and able to keep up with New Mexico State. The only thing that redeemed the game, the old ladies who karate chopped their ways into fans' hearts. But the boys were back in the spectrum to take on New Montana Tech. Shockingly, with EJ Ferris starting at point rather than pain. But Brock Heath obviously wanted to prove his status to Stu by putting back 16 points, 5 assists, and he only had one turnover, which is a huge improvement for the usual last minute Butterfinger. He played hard, forcing his way into the paint to make those close shots. And Reed was a crowd pleaser with this as he flies through the air and blocks that shot. And here's our main man, Preston Medlin, who seems to be like the only consistent player on the team gets the N1. But even though there were some good plays throughout the night, the boys struggled to keep up with Montana Tech, who should have been a blowout game for USU. They were behind for most of the game, and Stu Morrill was clearly disappointed with the quality of gameplay that the guys brought. 
history after practice, I had some oral surgery, and that was better than what I just saw. So that's about what I thought of that game. They came out, and they were... I mean, they were hitting some shots that I felt like we were we were pretty close to them, and they were, I mean they were they were shooting it over us, and they were going in. They were they came out ready to play, and uh, I guess necessarily we didn't come out as ready to play as we should be. So when you're <clears throat> Division One basketball, you play 31 games, you should be ready to play. It's not the NBA; you don't play 80 games. The guys are back in the spectrum this Saturday for the ESPN Bracket Buster against UC Santa Barbara. Tip off is at 7:05 p.m. You know, guys, this is a huge game this weekend for USU because it's basically a deciding factor on whether the Aggies are going to be able to compete in the NCAA tournament and the WAC tournament. Yeah, let's hope the Aggies can keep it together, you know, finish with a winning season. <laughs> for real. <laughs> Definitely. Well, when we come back, we'll show you how a community is rallying together to help a veteran get back on his feet. You may know someone who is in active military service for our country. The USU ROTC program trains students to enter active service when they graduate. Brianna Bodily joined the troops in a drill up Green Canyon last Thursday to find out what the training involves. Brianna, what are you doing out there? I'm taking cover in the bushes. This is something <laughs> I learned from the ROTC. If bullets are flying, you don't want it to be your body that catches one. I'm trying to like hide out. Although the fire in this drill was all verbal, the troops are still under pressure to do it right. With real Jacob battle Ginsburg tactics, is indicated by the red octagon. prisoners of war, and chain of command, the ROTC adds as much reality to the situation as possible. Embedding media was another way of adding to the experience. In the real army they actually will a lot of the times have media incorporated in. It's easier than having media simply on the battlefield. It's easier to incorporate them into the platoons and the squads. Cadet Worsley is one of many ROTC soldiers who contract with the military to one day serve on active duty. You really feel like you, you owe it to your country because we, I really feel lucky to uh, be an American and feel lucky to be able to give back. Although he says he joined the ROTC for the scholarship, Out here, right another reason has made him want to stay. You see the kind of passion and devotion that, that these soldiers have to their country and it's, it's just really inspiring. This is only one of many perspectives journalism students had a glimpse of last Thursday when we were invited into the military world and the soldiers learned what it was like to have a journalist in ranks. I think media is it can be difficult to work with at times, but um, I think it's also good that, um, that they see what's going on um, wherever we're in a conflict. Up hills, through rivers, and sprawled on the ground, it's all part of war. I can tell you one thing. In this battle, our guys won. ends, the ROTC keeps right on training. In fact, some cadets will be training in camps across the world. Shooting and ducking will not be something that will be out of the picture. All right. Thanks, Bruce. Thanks, Brianna. Am I good now? After coming home from serving our country, Corporal Isaac Jensen is still adjusting to life without legs. With new life adjustments ahead of him, his community of friends and neighbors are pulling together to help make life easier for him. I was there in West Point to see it all take place. One of my buddies opened up a refrigerator and there were two 100 pound bombs in the base of this refrigerator. November 9th, 2008, a day that would change Corporal Isaac Jensen's life forever. It took out my left knee, uh, shattered my right foot completely, uh, broke a, a lot of bones in my hand, uh, a lot of nerve damage. As a combat medic, awesome. he helped others before helping himself. I put two tourniquets on him, one on his arm and one on his leg with one hand, and I gave him my last thing of morphine. And from there, I made sure they were both breathing, and I pushed myself against a pillar. Three years later, Corporal Jensen is finally getting a home designed for him. For Isaac, you know, he lives in a world that isn't really always, you know, wheelchair accessible. His wheelchair doesn't fit through the doors in the bathrooms, and he can barely go down the hallways, and there's rooms he can't even get into. And that's what Homes for Our Troops is building for him. Wider hallways, roll under countertops, uh, roll in showers, and uh, basically more accessibility for the veteran to uh, allow them access and uh, ease of movement throughout the home. 
As you can see, the house is going up very quickly. This morning was just a concrete slab, but now it has walls and a roof. This is the most amazing thing that we could ever do with our time. You know, uh, Isaac's giving so much, and I mean, this small thing we're doing doesn't even, it pales in comparison to the sacrifice that he made. Corporal Jensen says the new home will allow him to help with his son more. I have a four-year-old. He's got to see that, that I still can be strong and that I, I can overcome anything. To him, I'm Superman. Well, I have to prove that to him. Well, thanks for watching ATV News. I'm Carly Lichty. I'm Britta Anderson. And I'm Bailey McMurdy. Have a great week, Aggies.